Well, praise the Lord. Christ is risen. How wonderful that he is alive to never be stopped again. I am so glad that we can worship him on a Sunday Easter morning and we can celebrate a living Christ because he has risen. I am so glad you showed up. I know many of our people have gone to spend time with family, but we are here and we are going to worship him and we already did and we will continue. Well, Jesus is alive. This morning, we're going to go through a lot of scripture. We're going to read scriptures quite a bit today. And so I know the operator will be very busy paging from one scripture to the next. If you uh, want to follow along there, that would be great. And we want to just look at the word of God and we want to celebrate that Jesus is alive. And one of the things that we want to look at is, is what does Easter prove? Why? What is it proving to us? Today, millions of people are celebrating Easter morning. Some did it at sunrise, some doing it right now, some are way ahead of us on time, but they are all celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. They are celebrating because the tomb is empty. Just a little bit over a year ago, Hans and Tina Gunter and Alina and I, we checked it out and sure enough, it is empty. We walked in there and it is empty. Jesus is alive. There were three ministers were asked what they want people to say at their funeral. The one said, well, I want him to say that he put God first, family second, and self last. The second guy says, I want him to say, I serve God, I serve my family, and I serve my church well. And the third guy says, I want him to say at my funeral, look, he's still moving. Jesus Christ did not stay dead. He moved. He moved out of the tomb into the world. He moved into our hearts, into our lives. And he is moving in this room right now. He's alive. He moved. You know, that also sets us apart. Christianity is set apart from any other religion. Other religions may have great leaders. They died. They stayed dead. You go to their tomb, you go to their grave, and you'll find the decayed bones. But you go to the tomb of Jesus... It is empty. He moved. He moved out of the tomb to never being stopped again. So that is what Easter proves. First, what Easter proves is that God is in control. God is always in control. Nobody can raise a dead person being dead for three days to life. Only God. That proves that that God is in control. Secondly, God has the last word. Some of you growing up, some of you are still growing up. When when you have an argument with your siblings, don't you always have to have that last word? And if nothing else, you just say it quietly, but you're going to have the last word. Uh, Some of you, when you argue with your spouse... You gotta have the last word, right? Like in our marriage, the last word always. No, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, but don't we always want to have the last word? God always has the last word, always. Jesus was severely beaten. They nailed him on a cross. This happened. They started nailing him to the cross about nine o'clock in the morning. At three o'clock, he cried out to his father and he breathed his last breath. Look at Mark chapter 15, verse 37 through 39. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. 
And when the centurions who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Now remember that evening, Pilate, uh, Joseph went to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. But Pilate had to check with his soldiers first to make sure that Jesus is dead. Now look at verse 45, Mark 15. It says, when he learned from the centurion that he was, that it was so, what was so? That Jesus was dead, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rocks. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Now this angry mob that screamed, crucify him, crucify him, said, Jesus is dead. Okay? The religious leader said, he is dead, he is out of our hair, he will never be a problem in our lives again. Joseph said, he is dead, and he was able with his own hands to take his body off the cross and put him in a tomb. Now the woman who loved Jesus saw where Jesus was laid in the tomb, and they said, Jesus is dead. Remember, they were planning on coming back and anointing his body as it was custom among them at that time. And so he, they said that he is dead. So everybody said, Jesus is no longer alive. He's dead. But God has the final word. God always has the final word. Look at Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 6. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman came, it took some spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found a stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say this, that should have been very easy. Because it wasn't like a big mansion tomb. It was just a tomb where you could walk in and right next to it there was a body. So they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside him. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the man said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Hallelujah. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. You see that? God has the last word. He said he would be risen on the third day. He always has the last word. The third thing that Easter proves is that God always keeps his promises. Listen to Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to be reading verse 62 and through 64. Then I also will read right away verses 65 and 66. It says, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, do you remember that while he was still alive, that this deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give us the order from the, for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body. Do you see how they're pleading now? Now they are begging and pleading for Pilate to do something about it. To secure this tomb. To make very sure that Jesus will stay dead. That he is not going to come out of the tomb. And so here's the plan. Verse 65 and 66. Take a guard, Pilate answered. And I, I like this. Go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and they made the tomb secure 
by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. When, when that tomb was sealed, you dare not touch that. And then you have a guard stationed. You touch it. You try to remove it. It's death sentence. The guard is going to kill you on the spot. And then look at Luke chapter 24, verse 6 through 8. Again, it says, he is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. I also love Matthew's account. And I'm going to read him right away too. I'm getting very excited every time I read this. I just love what Matthew says. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 and 2, it says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. I mean, wouldn't you have liked to be there? Here is like lightning, like earthquake. And here comes an angel of the Lord. And now he is touching that stone that has been sealed. That will be death sentence if you will remove it. And not just does he remove it, but I love it. And he sits on it. It's kind of like guards, don't you dare move this stone back, right? You're thinking about death sentences here. I'm not going to move. I, I mean, I just like that. He just sat on it. The angel, he comes like lightning and, and clothing as white as snow. And the guards are so surprised. They are like dead. They're like paralyzed. They're like frozen. Can you imagine what I would have looked like? I mean, they're the ones that's supposed to kill anybody that will touch that seal, that that's stone in front of the door of the tomb and they're just frozen they don't move they don't touch anything they don't say anything and then verse 5 and on in Matthew 28 it says but the angel answered and said to the women do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified he is not here for he is risen as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord laid. In other words, he says, come and see the empty tomb. I'm kind of wondering if they had to walk through those guards just to get to the tomb because they were guarding it. God keeps his promises. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. And he said before Jesus ever died, that he said that he's going to die, he's going to be crucified on a cross by sinful man, but he says on the third day, he is going to come out of the tomb alive. He's going to be alive. And now, in this passage, and today we celebrate that, God pulls it off. You know, it's one thing to make a promise, but it's another thing to actually pull it off, right? I mean, haven't you made a promise And later on, you couldn't pull it off. God can always pull it off. When he makes a promise, he will keep his promise. And God makes promises to you. He promises you eternal life. He promises you in in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 4. This is beautiful. He promises you and he says, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. You see, it's wonderful to know that we have a God that can keep his promises. And when he promises us, he is going to stand by it. When he promises, he is going to keep it. When he offers us life beyond the grave, when he offers us heaven, 
when he offers us reuniting with our loved ones and friends one day, he will keep his promise. He always keeps his promise. He always backs it up. Fourthly, what does Easter prove? It proves that God alone can meet your deepest need. It's so easy to be caught up in this world and the things of this world and and yet we realize that there is a need that is not met. We're missing something in our lives. Some people don't even know what their greatest needs are because they don't understand God and His promises. And that is why we try to fill things up with stuff. We try to fill up with stuff our lives because there is a great need in us and we want to satisfy that need. What does Easter prove? It proves that he can satisfy our needs. So many times, people will fill up their, their life with stuff. I mean, they got to buy every week something from the internet, or you buy a new car or a new home, and, and it's, then, it's, then it's so fun, it's so exciting, and, and then the next day, there is an emptiness again and a great need in us. Or, or, or some people even go as far as they got to pierce their whole body or tattooing their whole body because there's something that they need to give them the satisfaction. But they find it never if they go to the wrong places. So what does Easter prove? First, you got to look at the heart of God. Look at the heart of God. The heart of God is love. That is his character. That is who he is. It's perfect love. It's pure love. It's passion love. He pursues you. He loves you. Easter is that the cross and the resurrection gives us the message that we are loved. That we are loved with a perfect love, with a passion love, and a love that the world has never seen. 1 Peter 2, verse 24 says, He himself bore our sin in his body on a cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That emptiness that is inside of us, we've been healed. Jesus paid for that. Easter proves just how valuable you are to God. How much he loves you. That's the message of Easter. It's just such an amazing thing. It just amazes me how much God loves me. I mean, I I could understand if if Jesus may feel a little sorry for me to to one day go to hell and be tormented forever for my sins that I committed. I mean, that I may could get, but that he would love me so much that he would take that for me with that kind of a love, that's so amazing. It's so amazing that he would do that for you and me. He would do this for us. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let me tell you, folks, it wasn't when we already begged him, oh, Jesus, would you please help me? Or it wasn't when we already tried our best to live for Jesus, or we, we were doing a lot of good things for Jesus and made, trying to make him uh, to expre- uh, impress him with us. That's not when he saved us. That's not when he paid for our sins. He did it when we were still sinners, when we still hated him, when we wanted nothing from him. He took our place on a cross. How can you know that God loves you? Number one, because he says so. Number two, Easter. Look at the cross. Look at the cross. It shows us how much God loves us. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus laid his life down for you. There is no greater love than that. The cross is standing there for you and me. The greatest picture of Love is seen on the cross that he has done for us. He says it, he shows it, and he shouted it from the cross, it is finished. He said, this is done, I did it. Paid in full. He paid for our sin debt, a debt he did not owe. 
a debt that we owed. He didn't, he paid for. Why would he do that? Because of love. Because he loved us. He shouted it from the cross, it is finished. His mission was to come to this world to do that. To show us how much he loves us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. See, there it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, who's that? Whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Isn't that beautiful? See, we, we got to say what God says about us. When we accept him, then we, we say what God says about us. Let, let me pick on somebody. Who wants to be picked on? Nobody. That's good. I'm going to pick on somebody. I'll do it on Aldo because he's sitting right there and it's the first name that comes to my mind. So I'm just going to tell something to Aldo, but I'm going to tell it in front of all of you. For God so loved Aldo that he gave his only begotten son that if Aldo will believe in him, Aldo will not perish but have eternal life. Now, who wants to be picked on? All of us, right? That's what God says about every single one of us. That's love. For God so loved Tina, Isaac, Lena. Thank God, Gerhard, right? He says, I love you. That's the message of Easter. I love you and I have a plan for you. For this life now and after. What's our greatest need? Do you know what our greatest need is? To be completely forgiven. Jesus died for guilty sinners like you and me. Our greatest need is to be completely forgiven. Are you a sinner? Have you done something wrong? Have you done something that you regret? Do you have a secret inside of you that is just eating you up on the inside? I don't know why. I think there's somebody in here today that just really feels guilty on the inside. Do you feel guilty? Maybe you've been looking for the wrong places to get rid of that guilt. How can you get rid of it? Perhaps you have tried to get rid of that guilt by denying it. Just denying it. But that guilt doesn't, feeling, doesn't go away. Maybe you try to get rid of it by covering it up. Doing a lot of good things. Doing a lot of church things. But yet that seems to not satisfy the feeling of guilt. That guilt, that feeling is still there. Do you know why you feel guilty? Because you are guilty. That is such a hard thing for us to do, to actually admit that we are guilty. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the good news is you can get rid of that guilt. You can experience total forgiveness. Complete forgiveness from all your sins. That's our greatest need. And God loves you with a perfect love. And he wants to totally forgive you. And be cleansed. I mean, that's amazing grace, isn't it? That's God's mercy and love and grace, undeserved. And maybe you say, well, pastor, you don't know how bad I have been. You don't know how many and how severe sins I have committed. Listen, it's not about how bad you are or have been. It's about how good, how merciful, how loving God is. That's the key. That's the key. The bottom line is this. God wants to forgive you. 
God loves you more than you can imagine. He has a great plan for your life, and He wants to spend eternity with you, and He wants to start already and add throughout all eternity. God wants to forgive you. No one is so bad that God cannot forgive. No one is so good that he doesn't need God's forgiveness. God wants to meet the needs of our lives. Forgiveness isn't a prize to be won. It's a gift to be received. Christ did it. You can earn it. You don't deserve it. It comes from God's grace to be completely forgiven. And then when we are completely forgiven, he cleanses us through the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross. We have entered into the covenant of the new covenant of the blood of Jesus. We live with Christ. And he gives us resurrection power to cope daily in our lives. It is not just for now, but it's forever. But it is for now as well. Years after Jesus was raised from the grave, John saw him again. He was on an island that was the prison that he was in. And he saw Jesus again in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. And this is what uh, John recorded. When I saw him, which is Jesus, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Easter proves that Jesus Christ is alive and that he is resurrected, and now we are resurrected within him. He gives us abundant life, and not only that, he gives us eternal life. It means that we will never die. See, that is the good news. If your loved ones and friends are children of God and you are a child of God, then you never have to stand at their gravesite and say goodbye to them. All you got to do is, I'll see you later. Right? Because when this body fails us, it's just like taking off a coat. And have we just go into the glory and just really become alive like we never were alive before. And now that we are forgiven and we belong to God, now that you are a child of God, God also says, as you walk with me, I guarantee your path is going to end up in heaven and all eternity with me. And Jesus says in, in John 10, 28 and 29, he once says his father, and now he says also himself, he says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. See, God always promises he holds his end of the deal. He will carry through his promise. The grave is empty, he is alive, and he has now moved into our lives. And one day he's also going to move us into his glory. And what a glorious day that will be. May that be the God that we serve. May that mean to you and prove to you what Easter really is all about. May God bless you.